Why is it so hard to find reliable answers to parenting questions? How is it in 2022, parents still search on Google for answers from strangers? Well, now there's a better way. Introducing the Good Inside Membership, an expert-guided, community-powered platform redefining modern parenting. In our library, you'll find hundreds of bite-sized videos, articles, scripts, and workshops tackling the trickiest parenting topics. And it doesn't stop here. We've created a private community guided by me, Dr. Becky, and coaches trained in the Good Inside Parenting Method. Here you can ask questions, connect with other parents, or attend a live event on a topic that matters to you. This is the parenting handbook that doesn't exist. This is parenting advice at your fingertips, where you need it, when you need it the most. This is Good Inside Membership. Hi, I'm Dr. Becky, and this is Good Inside. I'm a clinical psychologist and mom of three on a mission to rethink the way we raise our children. I love translating deep thoughts about parenting into practical, actionable strategies that you can use in your home right away. One of my core beliefs is that we are all doing the best we can with the resources we have available to us in that moment. So even as we struggle, and even as we are having a hard time on the outside, we remain good inside. Eve Rodsky is on the pod today, and I couldn't be more excited. Eve is an expert in family mediation and organizational management, and she's the best-selling author of Fair Play and Find Your Unicorn Space. Eve is working to change society one partnership at a time by coming up with a 21st century solution to an age-old problem, women shouldering two-thirds or more of the unpaid domestic work and childcare for their homes and families. In today's episode, Eve and I talk about so many hot topics, carving out space for ourselves, managing guilt, where resentment and rage come from, and the manageable steps we can all take to feel better inside and feel more present in our relationships. With all that in mind, let's jump in. Hi, Eve. Hi, Becky. So good to see you. This is the best. I am so excited to be talking with you again and really excited to dive in. So we're going to talk about so many important topics today, but I'd love to hear kind of what's most on your mind. The thing that's been keeping me up at night is the statistic that 70% of the 1% in this country, right, the uh, people that make our policies and government and uh, in our corporations are white men with stay-at-home wives. Mm. And so what's keeping me up at night is just as people are starting to navigate um, back to in-office work and just how not normal, quote unquote, uh, the world still is, uh, especially for parents and caregivers, um, I'm seeing a huge disconnect between uh, what people want in terms of their workers and what uh, workers uh, are telling me um, they can give because they also need to be caregivers. So I'd say that's that's the thing that's keeping me up at night. Tell me a little bit more about that. Let's jump into some specifics about whether it's people's stories or what you're seeing even around you or hearing in terms of this disconnect. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah. I think what's happening is that so many um, women, I'll give you a little story. I remember when I was in um, I got to go to Davos, which was actually really amazing right before the pandemic to talk about uh, the fact that I had been doing research for 10 years, which started with my own marriage into the fact that um, I did not have the career marriage combo I thought I was going to have. Right. And um, I was losing my identity in my marriage and I was watching so many powerful women not being able to use their voice in the home. And so over 10 years, as I started to research these issues, around what is called the gender division of labor, um, definitely did not in my third grade science project or my like, what do you want to be when you grow up journal, uh, Becky, did not did not think being a gender division of labor advocate was um, on my list of things I wanted to do with my life. <laughs> but 
that's where I found myself in Davos um, in 2019. And I'd just written Fair Play. And I was trying to convince a room of executives that flexibility, that parenting out loud, that centering a care- the caregiver, the humanity in us is actually really important for the workplace because half of our population um, was going to drop out if we had one more crisis. And I remember uh, one man said to me, well, what can we do? I said, just be the BBC dad. I want to see you on Zooms being, um, or whatever it was back then, you know, on camera being interrupted by your kids and a walker and not pushing them out of the room and hiding them, but parenting out loud, um, not making your workers have to hide when they have to go take their kids to a doctor's appointment. Just understand that our humanity is in our caregiving. And so I said, I wish for you that you will all become the BBC dad. And then ironically, right, we have a month later, we're all the BBC dad. We're all, you know, of course, there's essential workers who couldn't afford the privilege of being home, but over 20 million workers were in their homes. And so I think a lot about what I saw in those parents before, including myself, uh, especially women, uh, we hold two thirds or more of what it takes to run a home and family. That was the statistic I was undeniably living for 10 years before I even understood that it was happening to me. I was the default parent for literally every single household and domestic task for my family. I call that the she fault parent. And so I think it is understanding that even before the pandemic, what I saw in thousands of interviews now, I'm, I'm into the tens of thousands of interviews, was just the, the physical toll of being told our whole lives that having it all means doing it all and watching women and myself not only lose our identity, but lose our mental health, our physical health to this idea of not believing that we have a permission to be unavailable from our roles. So that was the number one thing women told me that was holding them back in their life, that they didn't believe they had a permission to be unavailable from their roles as a parent, a partner, and a professional. But what you're saying is so many of the women that you've talked to feel like I I can't take that extra space for myself. Is that what you're saying? Correct. And I know, correct. I, and I love your term, you'll correct me if you would say it differently, mm-hmm. this, like unicorn space, this idea of like, I can step yes. out of my role as a parent, not just to do something, quote, productive, or to take the trash out or to pay taxes, but, but for something else, right? 100%. And I think that is something that I think about all the time. Because again, the same way I didn't want to be a gender division of labor specialist, I did not think I'd be writing or thinking about women's collective identity, um, especially in America. But I'll tell you about this breast cancer march I was on that I write about in Fair Play, because it sort of gets to the heart of what we're talking about here. It was nine women. Uh, I was with them. We were honoring a friend who had been diagnosed. This was 10 years ago, uh, 2011 or 2012. And they all look like you, right? I mean, they were smart, not look like you physically, but like they all they all were like you in that they were very powerful in their own right. Um, they were using their voices uh, for the greater good in many cases. There was an Oscar-winning producer there and CEO of a nonprofit. And it's just really, really wonderful morning. I remember we were all um, covered in, in like pink glitter and we were sort of marching and we were about to have lunch in downtown LA. And... What happened to us was, this was after I was already becoming uh, aware in my own marriage that things were starting to feel really unfair after my second son, Ben, was born, which was exactly around the same time. But at this march, around noon, we literally became like the reverse of Cinderella. I don't know, maybe pumpkins. <laughs> we turned into pumpkins. or we, we, we started getting inundated with phone calls and texts from our partners. All of us, except for one, was married, was married to a man um, with things like, I'm done, right? I'm done. It was noon already. Like, when are you coming home? Where's Hudson's soccer bag? Uh, Where'd you leave me the gift? And what's the address of the birthday party? My favorite was my friend Kate's husband who texted her, do the kids need to eat lunch? (laughs) That was a good one. But um, what disturbed me the most about that day, I think, was just, and again, this was pre-consciousness, right? This is before I knew that this was happening to me. Obviously, this is way before fair play. But what I was recognizing was the the shocking thing was that not one of the other women said to me, okay, Eve, let's just go to our lunch and shut off our phones. Every single one of those women said to me, I left my partner with too much to do. And they literally ran. They ran home to find Hudson's soccer bag, to bring a perfectly wrapped gift to a birthday party, 
and to feed their kids lunch. And that day, the, the, my act of resistance that day, because I started to resist this. I was like, I don't want to live like this anymore. And this gets to what we're going to talk about, how you can be a game changer in your own life, in your own marriage, even in the midst of messed up systems like we started the podcast with. But it was asking these women, okay, if you're not, if you're going to like ghost me for lunch, then at least help me count up how many phone calls and texts we've received. And we had 30 phone calls and 46 texts for 10 women over 30 minutes. And that's the day when I realized that this, you know, private lives are public issues, that the home is super dangerous, Becky, because it, you know, we think we're fighting over um, Hudson soccer bag, but ultimately this is about years and years and lifetimes of society (laughs) building itself, our foundation of our house, of, of the house of our society has been built on the unpaid labor of women. And when we uh, outsource, quote unquote, that was always a very sort of white feminist thing to say, well, I can, if you outsource, but then it's the undervalued labor of women of color. So I keep coming back to the bigger issues too, because while I was learning about this in my marriage and feeling such rage and resentment over the fact that Seth was texting me that day, asking me where my kids' pants were (laughs) to get them out of the house and such rage at Kate's husband for asking if her kids need to eat lunch. Really what was happening was, it, to me, it was that my eyes were opening to the fact that we can no longer live this way where women are the default, the she fault for literally every single household and domestic task. In addition to launching a new business as Dr. Kennedy is doing here, in addition to uh, being a breadwinner in many households for their families. So that's the the full circle. That's the story that sort of started me on this journey to understanding that when you can start changing the dynamics in every individual marriage, you're also changing the politics and assumptions of our society. Okay, here's something I'm thinking about. Bringing together the larger sociological patterns with some individual psychological patterns. It makes me think about what happens to us as women when we get a text about our partner's discomfort in child caring. Yeah, yeah. My partner's taking care of the kids. I'm at a breast cancer walk or something that even seems less noble. My partner is taking the kids and I am getting a manicure <laughs> or I am sleeping in, right? I am not doing good. I'm not walking for, I'm just doing something <laughs> for myself because that's the baseline. And I get the text of, where's Hudson's soccer bag, or uh, you didn't leave me the right food for lunch. Maybe my partner knows that they should have lunch, but then, right, what happens for me on an individual level? And one of the things I see in women over and over and over is that my partner's distress becomes my guilt. But what happens where my partner is uncomfortable taking care of my kid, the two kids, figuring out lunch? Okay, And and my partner's male. I know your partner's male. So I'm going to say him for now because that's Mm -hmm. our lives. He's uncomfortable. I was doing something that I found enjoyable. And all of a sudden, his distress becomes my guilt. And then I'm going back to that story of what happened on the breast cancer walk. That guilt now motivates me to change my behavior to assuage my guilt. But really now I'm doing something. I'm going back home to make my kids lunch to take care of my partner's discomfort. There's so many transfers of emotion. His and em- then the rage. I love that you always talk about how that ends up leading to that resentment leads to rage, right? It's that circle. A hundred percent because when we take on other people's feelings in that way and then also take on actions and change to take care of someone else's feelings, our body knows we're not really doing that for us. Our body knows we just missed out on something else, right? And in the short term, we can manage our guilt, right? But in the long term, the resentment builds up and it just is going to take one tiny thing for the entire vat of resentment (laughs) to come out and, you know, exactly look like rage. And then in those moments, it's like, whoa, why are you? Why are you so emotional about this little thing, yeah. right? And really, it's the last number of things or like you did, it's the last, it's the hundreds of years of this mm-hmm. shit, right? That's been inherited. Absolutely. And I'll add, so that's your, the witch's cauldron. So we'll, we'll call that sort of the, um, the cauldron that you just uh, built, which is so beautiful. And that analogy is so beautiful. And again, why do I love talking to you is because I think the combination of sociology and 
the individual psychology, the way you break it down is so impactful because it allows us to recognize um, when we're complicit in our own oppression and when we're also what we can do about it. But the last thing I'll add to that witch's cauldron is just we have an identity before that we can remember. So to me, the, the witch's cauldron after all that rage and resentment is also remembering that at one point in my life, there was a spark and fire in me that was about me. Mm. Um, I, and I talked, I was on this, um, amazing, uh, author talk with a, uh, author named Rachel Yoder, who wrote a book called Night Bitch. And you would love this because you could really analyze her Kafka <laughs> way of, um, writing about her identity loss. But in, in her book, it's a fictionalized book of a woman who turns into a dog because of her, uh, anger and resentment over her choices of becoming mm-hmm. what I call an accidental traditionalist, but, um, a stay at home mom due to the choices of her, of her life. And so it's so fascinating because we both were talking about the fact that to become a night bitch again, you have to remember the spark inside of you. Like she was saying when she was 17, she could do anything. Yes. And I think we can all ask ourselves, where is she? When's the last time she came out? when and where and how did she learn that it was really dangerous to keep being seen? Where were those lessons? And where can I make contact with her now? Because for everyone listening, and and I do think there's people listening who would say, yeah, I don't know if I ever really knew that girl. Like right from the start, I was the good, complicit, what do people want of me child. But what I know and what I think about so often with all the different people I've even worked with in the therapy setting who I've gotten to know in such deep ways, that part of us, it's there for everybody because that part is the most in touch with our individual wants for ourselves. It's been named as selfish by other people. That is a gaslighting term. I mean, it's a part that has access to self which is like not the same thing that's as good. selfish. Yeah, that's, right? good. that's good. That, that's pretty solid, right? Like access to self. That seems like life sustaining. <laughs> but actually, all this talk about self, about access to our wants and needs and creativity, Eve, this really makes me think about your term, unicorn space. What is unicorn space? It is the answer to this question, which is going to still sound a little bit esoteric, and then we'll break it down. It's the answer to the question, what makes you you and how you share that with the world? It is, what are you curious about? What community do you have to share that with? And how do you complete something? The curiosity, many women do have curiosities. Many women do have communities that they feel like they could share with. But a lot of times we get stuck in the completion phase. Because of perfection, I'm sure you have lots of things to say about that. But that completion phase of not living in unfulfilled dreams. But if you have a curiosity, if you have a community, a connection to somebody externally, and then you have some completion, that's all you really need. And it doesn't have to be hard. It could be literally making one pottery wheel and like color me mine with your child. Um, It could be learning your old piano song one more time. For me, I start to dance again. At the end of the day, it requires you to believe that you have permission to be unavailable from your roles to carve out that time. And the last thing I will say, it is not soul cycle. Self-care is important, but what we see in eudaimonia, eudaimonic well-being, which is what this is about, that's linked to mental health and longevity, um, it's not the personal pursuits. It's the sharing with the world. Christina Tosi, you know, of Milk Bar, I was watching her in a documentary and I was like, yes, she has it. Because she said the first thing that made her want to bake was not how good her cake was. It was what it felt like to share it with a neighbor. Mm, You know, people give me all types of feedback on my Instagram or, you know, now I run to people on the street. And, you know, what feels best to me, this is totally true, is when people say, you know, maybe I read something and like, here's what happened in my home or here's what that felt like to me versus comments that are more like, oh, Dr. Becky, you're you're amazing or that's such a smart idea. And to watch us put things out there and then watch what that does, watch watch impact or watch someone else access something in them is just, it's the most amazing feeling in the world. And that that really, that that's definitely one of the things that drives me in my unicorn space. It, the other thing, and I think it relates to Maybe what you're saying for so many women that the hardest part is the completion, like, okay, this is this is going to put it out there, is the idea of 
am I looking for someone to give me approval or good enoughness? Or am mm. I in touch with or learning to be in touch with the feeling of like, this lights me up. When I talk mm-hmm. about parenting ideas, it lights me up. Mm-hmm. I I don't even really notice how people react. <laughs> like it's a icing on the cake if they're like, that was a great talk. But it, it's just icing on the cake. Like I kind of know inside me, like that felt great or oh, that part needs tweaking. That didn't feel as great. And it makes me think about how often women are raised to gaze out first. What does everybody think? And we really have to build the muscle of gazing in. What do what do I think? Meaning, really, it's not really so much about thoughts, but what does this feel like to me? That flow state, that, oh, I'm creating something. This is fun. This is creative. And I really feel like that feeling is maybe one of the things you're talking about. When you're in that feeling, you might be in that unicorn space. That could be its own guide. You said it lights you up. Yes. That's that That's that girl. That's your girl. You, again, you may not have known her earlier. Or I, I don't know how you were raised. But for me, when I was that, that lighting up again is my connection to my past. It's my own transitional object. I wear a, uh, a ring that reminds me of my grandmother. And she never sold a, a diamond ring that she took with her through uh, the depression. And I wear it. It's my transitional object to her and the women behind me. But my transitional object back to myself is exactly that feeling. Mm. It's recognizing that I remember what it felt like to be in a flow state and to say that, you know what, I'm going to keep doing this, even though I may not be as good of a dancer. I can't turn on my left foot because I have a bunion, a bone spur, like a million calluses. But I, I signed up for a dance class again. It was outdoors. Like I could follow the choreography. Like I was so proud of myself. And so it's that I may not be the same as I was at 17, but I feel that light. And you're right. It is called the flow state. The flow state is a very interesting topic for me because flow has often been written just by white men. And I know that there's a reason for that because the flow state men who I love and who have taken on flow state to continue to the present um, are people that have that day that also say things like you just need two uninterrupted days of, for deep work. And not that I don't love that idea, but in our society, when women are interrupted every three minutes and 42 seconds, the advice of a pale and male man to tell me I need to take two days for uninterrupted attention to my work a week feels highly privileged. And I will say that I've been doing some research and I spoke to Anne-Marie Slaughter about this. In her new book, she talks about the fact that all these philosophers like Emerson and Walden Pond and contemplating with nature, it turns out that their wives and mothers were bringing them food in the woods. Mm. They were bringing them food in the woods. So I think the more realistic thing that Dr. Kennedy and I are talking about here is the idea that we deserve a permission to be unavailable. We know society is not giving us that easier. We're here to be a community for you to say you deserve it. And that whatever it is, that light inside of you, it deserves not to be burned out. A couple of questions, because I hear especially some women's questions in my head. I don't make money. And I feel like my partner would say to me, oh, you need time kind of to yourself? Like what? Like, isn't that what you get all day? Or isn't that what you get when the kids are in preschool? That was a very big part of the resistance to my work, Fair Play. Um, It was this idea that I make my wife's life. Like, what does she have to complain about? What does she do all day? If you're so overwhelmed, just get help, right? All these messages that are actually really gaslighting because what they do is they perpetuate a stereotype that women's time is infinite like sand (laughs) um, and men's time is finite like diamonds. So what do I mean by that? Practically, what that means is that if we're a society that doesn't value women's time, we're going to do things like when women enter a male profession, salaries will automatically come down, which always happens. Throughout history, if women enter a male profession, salaries automatically go down. Um, we, we will say things to women in our society, such things as breastfeeding is free, mm. when literally it's 1,800 hours um, of our time. It's, it's an actual full-time job. But I think the hardest part was what we hear about our time ourselves, right? The, what did you do all day? Yes. Um, you do all these unnecessary things. You could free up your time if you stop doing unnecessary things. I make your life. I'm the one who puts a roof over our head. Mm. Um, then we start internalizing it and we could become complicit in our own oppression. And I know this from the sociology and you can probably analyze this 
a lot from internally, but we start saying things to ourselves like, well, of course I should do it because my husband makes more money than me or my partner makes more money than me. This happens in LGBTQIA relationships as well. Or you say things like, uh, in the time it takes me to tell him or they what to do, I should do it myself. Or you start saying things, you rationalize yourself, well, I'm just a better multitasker. I'm wired differently for this task. Or you say, yeah, we're both colorectal surgeons, but I should just handle uh, the school forms because my partner's better at, at doing one thing at a time and I can find the time. And so if you keep saying you can find the time, you can find the time, right? We have to recognize we're not Albert Einstein, right? We can't find time. We can't (laughs) fuck with the space-time continuum. We have limited time, 24 hours in a day. And the unpaid labor, what we often call chores and housework, but I call our humanity, those are a full-time job. Your partner does not make your life by putting a roof over your head. You make their lives by having a family for why they would even put a roof over their head in the first place. It is just a different way to view and value women's time. If we start to protect and guard our time, then society starts changing. So we, people get scared of that message, but we can do that individually. Um, And so, yes. So what I like to say is all those messages, if you say them to yourselves, of course, yes, you will probably end up doing more unpaid labor in your home if your partner works outside the home, but you have to insist that you don't do it all because that is more than a full-time job. We know the time diaries. It is more than 24 hours in a day and you actually don't have it. And so what it ends up leading to is multitasking, stress, forgetfulness, not having any time for yourself, and then guilt and shame over your partner looking at you and saying, what is wrong with you? Like, why are you so stressed? And then on top of that, God forbid you decide you want to leave your relationship and that person leaves with their degree, their job, and then you're there, what, begging for alimony? The dynamics in our culture are really messed up. So what I'm here to say is you can start so small by just saying, you know what, my time is diamonds. For me, Becky, in my own household, I had so much rage and resentment. I write about that in Fair Play over Seth. I was just raging and raging at him until I finally had that aha moment that, oh my God, when Seth has four hours after our kids go to bed to watch Sports Center, you know, I'm like, oh wow, he has four hours to check PowerPoint, to uh, work on his career, to work out, to watch some Sports Center. Whereas literally, literally, I'm doing things in service of our household until my head hits the pillow after midnight. So much so that I would start banging around because I was doing things. And he's like, you're making too much noise at night. And so when I realized that, oh my God, this is an issue around time choice. I get 24 hours in a day, just like Seth does. And I deserve equal time choice, as much time choice over how I use my day as my husband has. That was a huge aha moment for me. So that's a long answer to say that the unlearning is why you're here. That's exactly right. So I'm going to ask you, for people listening, where do you tell people or like the first couple places they can start? What is after someone listens to this and they feel inspired, which I think they will, what what are a couple of things people can do to start, you know, feeling more in touch with themselves, lighting themselves up? The first thing I would ask is what's the hurdle? And, and all I can tell you are what the most common three were for, for women, at least. I interviewed men as well and non-binary individuals, but for women, it was, so I'd ask you to say, you know, is, do I feel like most connected to the boundary issue of domestic encroachment, meaning like I sit down for my piano lesson and it's 2.40 and I'm like, ah, yes, grandma's picking up, but I might as well go pick up my kids, Mm. right? That's a domestic encroachment. That's a boundaries breach. Are you feeling that the guilt and shame, like we said earlier, those feelings are coming up from our past. So you're like, you know, your 20 year old self where that helped you is now hurting you. Or is it that you um, don't believe you have a permission to ask for what you need? Mm. I think I would would look at that because then literally you just book it with someone else. (laughs) You can book your dance time. It helps a lot for those women to book something with somebody else, to have accountability partner, a success partner that helps. It goes from 65% to 95% completion if you have a success partner like that. So Becky, you and I are going to write together in a cafe. I can't disappoint Becky by showing up. So then I get to transfer my guilt to somebody else. (laughs) But at least it's still there, but at least it's for my, I know you're my accountability partner. If it's a guilt and shame issue, one quick thing that I started to do, and this came from Dr. Cheryl Gonzalez Ziegler, a friend of mine who years ago helped me reframe guilt by saying, I feel guilty. I didn't put Anna to bed. She just said, you know what? You're going to start saying I made the choice not to put Anna to bed because. I love that. 
I just want to like highlight that for everyone, right? Oh, I feel so guilty that I went out to dinner with my friends and my daughter ended up having such a hard night when my partner put my daughter. <sighs> That's the guilt interpretation. And and really, there's such power to say, oh, hi, guilt. You're going to be with me a while. So hi. <laughs> just write all the lists. You have probably have a long list of things you feel guilty about. This is one. Okay, keep going. Other side is being a little more in touch with myself. I made the choice. I made the choice to go out to dinner with my friends. I don't know about for you, Eve, but I love layering because I've taken that. I've heard that from you and I love that. I made the choice to go out to dinner with my friends and almost always we can add, and I'm allowed to make decisions that prioritize myself, like giving yourself that active permission. I love that. I'm putting, I'm putting you on, you're going on my post-it wall, which is a big deal. <laughs> but I love that layering because I think what, what the other beautiful thing you always do that I notice is, and my mother does this, so that's why I'm very attuned to what you do. Uh, she does it as a social worker, but you frame either or decisions to both and. It's such a powerful thing that you do. I see it all the time that it's okay for me to live with my guilt and I can still go out to dinner. Yes. I love I love how you do that. And I think it's very, very powerful for your listeners. Yes. And it's why I, you know, I'm obsessed with your work. <laughs> well, you know. and likewise, what else can people do? And can you give me something, give us all something where I know I want my partner to do more. I know, I know of the 100 tasks you break down in Fair Play. And if you're listening and you haven't read Eve's first book, Fair Play, <laughs> I really mean this. And anybody listening to this podcast will know I'm not one to just like promote a million products. Like I've actually read your book a million times and it is so practical. And I hear about it from people in my practice all the time. I said, wow, this has been so useful, such a great system, right? So there's 100 tasks you break down. I feel like I do I, I do 100. I feel like I'm in charge of 100. I'm in charge of whatever the number is. It doesn't have to be 100. It's I'm breaking down. I know you would even say, Eve, don't go show your partner that list as step never, one and say, hey, never. you're a bad person. Take something. Right? Like, yes, take 50. Was- I need you to say, I need you to go from right. zero. But what I'm doing now is unsustainable. Where can I start? Well, I'll tell you what the science has showed me, right? What my data has showed me. Um, this is qualitative research now. Um, and all I can tell you is I have thousands of touch points. So the two things where people start um, are two different ways. So step one, and they're not in order. These are almost like different choices the way people start. Step one, people start with the realization that their home is their most important organization. Oh, I love that. So especially for men and women, um, opposite sex relationships, this idea that that question, what if we treated our home as our most important organization? What if we centered our home first, not our workplaces? How would it look different? So a lot of people start to think that way and just ask their, their partner that question. When emotion is low, cognition is high, how would things look different? Oh, well, oh, you know, one couple did that and they were la- they laughed at me and they said, well, we wouldn't be waiting to, to decide who's taking the dog out right? When it's about to take a piss on the rug, right? Mm-hmm. We wouldn't be deciding who's setting the table when we're already hangry and cranky. So this idea that we collapse under decision fatigue because we make the same decision over and over again. If you take and invest in the time to decide in advance, then you don't have to keep making the same decision over and over again. And that's just organizational management 101. You want to move to efficiency. So that is one piece of it. This idea that And there's a very dangerous word that as an organizational manager, I used to hear when I would ask the early days of fair play, when I started to make the should I do spreadsheet that became the fair play system. But when it was just still a list and we know list alone don't work, we just told you that. But I would say like, who's in charge of bathing and grooming the kids? And then I'd hear, we both do it. Who's in charge of travel? We both do it. Who's in charge of hosting? We both do it. And I was like, oh my God, this is like organizational management nightmare. You never want to hear both. You want to hear clearly delineated expectations and roles because that's how you get to the most important thing an organization can ever have, and that's accountability and trust. And so if you're saying we both do these things, what we have to recognize is that typically that means, and let's do one for groceries, that you're the one serving you know, your household for what they need. You notice that Johnny likes yellow mustard, otherwise he chokes with his protein. You're getting stakeholder buy-in for what your family needs for the week. You monitor that mustard for when it's low. And then you, ultim- you, then you send your partner to the store to go get that mustard. Well, they're going to bring home spicy Dijon, right? Not the yellow. And then you're going to tell me, well, I can't trust my partner with my living will because um, he can't even bring home the right type of mustard. So, so that organizational failure, this flip side 
is the ownership mindset to understand, start where you are now, but to say when somebody does something, okay, you know what? We're going to host tonight. I'll keep you involved in the planning, but you know what? I'm not going to yell at you when you don't put the music up higher. Like I'm in charge of this party. Um, and, and you'll do the next one, right? It's this idea that you can, you can, you don't have to be the dishes doer forever, but if you're going to, don't sit there at the sink together, um, just say, you know what, it's your turn tonight from the secret oils in the drawer, as my son says, all the way to putting them away, start to finish. That's how we do things in the workplace. That's it. The last thing I will say, if the ownership mindset is not where you are yet, the other thing people have started with is just the idea of a 10 minute a night check-in where they bring short-term reward substitution like ice cream or alcohol, and they just start a practice of investing in their relationship and their communication like they do exercise. Less than exercise. 10 minutes, set a timer. You can come to, to this practice either way, through the ownership mindset or through the, the a communication check-in. I think that both those such great actionable ideas. And the only thing I want to maybe layer on top of that is one of the things I hear over and over from couples I work with is this classic fight that happens and especially happens when people have kids, which is, oh, I do everything around here on one side. <laughs> and the other side is whenever I do something, I'm, I'm not doing it right. Right. Or right. So it's I do everything. And yeah, I, I have to quote, nag you. I have to tell you to do things because you don't do things on your own. And well, I don't do so many things because whenever I do it, I get it wrong. And right. And the way I see that intersecting with what you're saying is we can talk to our partners about neither of us want to have that fight. It doesn't feel good to either of us, right? In couples language, we both keep getting on the dance floor and doing that dance. It, neither of us <laughs> want to do that dance, but it, it's like we keep doing it together. It's not good for you. It's not good for me. And it's not good for our marriage. It's not good for anyone. And actually, one of the ways around that is to think about just different things. Let's just forget forever, just today that we have to do and just say, right, we each can own the entire arc. And I'm going to use your language, right, which is like the conception, the planning, and the execution. Because the only time the, hey, did you do this? Oh, I can never do anything right really comes up is when we've split those different tasks. That's right. And it's, it's it, I just imagine, like, say you came in, right? And I said, you said, Eve, can you host my podcast today? Well, I'm just letting you know that my, my heart's pounding um, I don't know what to do. I have no context. I just feel like um, there. I have no. <laughs> like it would not work for me. And 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 again, that's why fair play became a love letter to men because I know that workplace when someone just tells you to do that with zero context, um, it leads to mistakes. It leads to you saying, "Oh my God, what what the? Why were you talking to people about uh, groceries and trash today? Like we were supposed to be talking to people about relationships." Well. Because it relates, you know, then I have to like justify myself and why I made those decisions. It's just not the dance we want to get into. I think that's exactly right. Well, you and I have so many more conversations we need to have. So this is yeah. kind of yeah. one part of many. Thank you so much for being here. Your work is so important. I've seen it help so many people. I know it's going to help so many more people. So thank you for sharing with all of us what lights you up. I can tell you it has very much impacted me and my family. And I can't wait for the next time we get to speak. Thanks, Eve. Bye. Eve and I talked about so many important topics. Here are the three things I'll be continuing to think about after this episode. One, the phrase... I can make time for that. Let's realize we don't make time. If we prioritize time for something, we have less time for other things. Think about who and what you make time for. See if you are on that list, if your unicorn space is included. As Eve said, remember that your time is diamonds. Two, remember that two things can be true. You can feel guilty and you can take care of your own needs. You can feel uncomfortable and speak up to your partner. You can care about your kids and care about yourself. When you feel like you have to choose one thing or another, take a deep breath and find a framework where two things can be true. Three, check out Eve's books. I'm saying this from me to you. There is no sponsorship, no kickbacks here. Fair Play and Find Your Unicorn Space are books you will read over and over again. 
Eve puts words to our experience and gives us frameworks and strategies to feel less resentful, more satisfied, more lit up inside. Thanks for listening to Good Inside. There are so many more strategies and tips I want to share with you. Head to goodinside.com and sign up for Good Insider, my free weekly email with scripts and strategies delivered right to your inbox. And follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Dr. Becky at Good Inside for a daily dose of parenting and self-care ideas. Good Inside with Dr. Becky is produced by Beth Rowe and Marie Cecile Anderson and executive produced by Erica Belsky and me, Dr. Becky. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to rate and review it or share this episode with a friend or family member as a way to start an important conversation. Let's end by placing our hands on our hearts and reminding ourselves, even as I struggle and even as I have a hard time on the outside, I remain good inside.